so what we did yesterday was derive this expression. This denotes electron phonon interactions. It has two terms, which one is B dagger, C dagger, C, and one B, C dagger, C. You can think of it as an electron absorbing a phonon and getting scattered, or an electron emitting a phonon and getting scattered. Next, what we are going to do is we are going to imagine interaction between two electrons such that one electron emits a phonon, is scattered, and the other electron absorbs this phonon and gets scattered. So effectively, you have an interaction between two electrons which is mediated by phonons. Now, this is a very general expression. What we are going to do next is to break this sum over G, which is sum over reciprocal lattice vectors, into two terms, that is G equal to zero term plus G not equal to zero terms. Now, the reason we do this is remember when you do Fourier transform of interaction potential, you find that for a potential that goes as 1 over r, where r is the relative coordinate, you find this to be 1 over q square. Right? So here also you have an interaction which is derivative of a function that depends on the radial coordinate. When you go through the algebra, you'll again find that vq goes as 1 over q square. That also means that when you have q plus g here, this will go as q plus g square. Any questions? So this is obviously going to be much smaller than this if you have a small lattice constant, which is typically the case. So the main point here is we are going to ignore all of these terms. The reason is all of these terms are smaller than g equal to zero term. And the reason we are going to do this is because we want to look at a simplified picture. But later on, if you want to improve your calculation, you could include other terms also. But this is a, to convince you that the most dominant effect is indeed coming from g equal to zero term. Yes? So specifying again to Coulomb potential? Uh, no, so this is, uh, we started with, yes, so we started with Coulomb potential between electrons and ions. <coughs> but now we are talking about uh, uh, this potential, which involves a gradient operator. So we started with that interaction, then we did Taylor expansion. And in the Taylor expansion, we kept the first order term, which is also dependent on UN. Yeah. Does that address your question? Yeah. And uh, in general, you can have scattering where you have G not equal to 0. And these are called umclap processes. And they could play an important role. But here we are looking at the most, looking for the most dominant effect, which will come from g equal to 0 term. Now also, I'm going to, this, this is still very general. It involves sum over all branches, all spin, and so on. So next, what I'm going to do is Simplify this a bit, but keep this Hamiltonian on board so you can see that there is a straightforward generalization of what we will do next. So I'm going to assume that we have electronic Hamiltonian. So I'm going to consider a Hamiltonian, which is the electronic Hamiltonian plus phononic Hamiltonian plus the interaction between them. 
the electronic Hamiltonian is the dispersion of electrons, CK dagger, CK. The phononic Hamiltonian is sum over Q, H bar omega Q. And the electron phonon interaction, which I'm going to write as sum over K and Q some function f, k, q, We only keep the g equal to zero term. We assume that we don't have, so we uh, get rid of this lambda, we assume there is only one branch, and we assume that the interaction does not depend on spin. Now, so let me get rid of this sigma also, sorry. The reason I'm uh, not keeping sigma is, remember what this, what does this scattering mean? You have an incoming electron that can absorb a phonon and get scattered. Now phonon does not have any spin, spin zero. So by process of absorbing a phonon, this electron cannot change its spin. Similarly, when an electron emits a phonon, it gets scattered into another electronic state, and the spin for this electronic state is also same as the incoming electronic spin state. So I can get rid of, I can drop the index sigma also. Yes? Uh, can we drop the index lambda as well, if there's only one branch, or is that? Oh yeah, sorry, I should not have written it. So we drop this also, yeah. And now, what we want to do is use this simplified form of this general expression to derive this. Derive an expression where we are interested in calculating the contribution of this diagram to the Hamiltonian. So there are many interaction terms. This is not the only one. There are many interaction terms. What I'm going to do next is calculate the contribution coming from this. And then I'm going to compare and look at parameter regime where this contribution can dominate. <clears throat> what we will find is that this contribution depends crucially on the dispersion relation of the electrons and phonons. So this vertex here, I will write as F k prime q. And this vertex here is F k q. Now one thing you can already see is that this diagram, if you calculate the, its contribution to the Hamiltonian, this is second order in F, right? So it is second order in electron phonon interaction. So what we are going to do next is assume that this interaction is small to begin with, do perturbation theory and drop all terms that are higher, F cube or higher, because this is what we are interested in. So we're interested in the second order contribution coming from this term. 
what we are going to do is use a trick known as schiffer wolf transformation. This is a very useful trick. So it's good to learn as many tricks as you can. It's very useful, and you can apply it to a variety of problems. And it's very handy for this problem in particular. Any questions so far? So let's formally discuss what this schiffer wolf transformation is. So the goal is to find a unitary transformation, u, that can be written as e to the power s, where s dagger is equal to minus s. So I want to find a unitary transformation that can be written as, so e to the power s, s is some operator, and it is such that s dagger is equal to minus s. If I have a unitary transformation that can be written like this, you can use operator algebra to show that the transformed Hamiltonian, which is e to the power minus s, h e to the power s, I think this was in tutorial one, this can be written as h. You can just expand the exponential and regroup terms to show this. h minus commutator of sh plus the second term, which is commutator of s with the commutator of s and h, and then the higher order terms. So this is just an identity. This is an expansion by expanding the exponentials. And now I'm going to look at only these terms. The reason will become apparent what, with what I will write next. So I will choose. So this is just a general identity. Now let's see how we can use it to do perturbation theory. So this is another way of doing perturbation theory. So my h is this, h electron plus h phonon plus h electron phonon. I'm going to choose, I will write this as h naught plus h electron phonon, where h naught is h electron plus h phonon. I'm going to choose s such that commutator of s and h naught is h electron phonon, which is proportional to f k q. Any question so far? This is just an identity, and this is this is where the problem gets a bit complicated. I have to now find an S that satisfies this. Now, if you can find this, let's see what happens. So if you find this, put this back in this identity, you would see that H tilde is H naught plus H electron phonon. So I'll just write down, okay, minus S H naught minus S H electron phonon plus half S S H naught plus half 
S Now if S H naught is H electron phonon, you will see this term will cancel. And if S H naught is H electron phonon, then you'll see these two terms, commutators are same, so you'll get a half factor of half. And this S S H electron phonon, this term is already third order in F. This is already F cube. So H tilde is now H naught minus half S H electron H phonon. So I will ignore all terms that are higher order in F cube or higher, and this will give me the result that I want. This will give me the contribution to the term to, to a term that is second order in F. Any questions so far? So I haven't really done anything so far. I've just rephrased the problem in terms of uh, perturbation theory. The goal, I still have not found what S is. So that is the non-trivial task in this way of doing the problem. How can we find an S that satisfies this property so that I can write this? Once I've found that S, I'll calculate the commut this commutator and that's it. That will be my term in the Hamiltonian. So, Let's try to see how we can do that. So as with most problems, you will have to, so when you don't know what to do, you can always guess something. Now, in this way of doing perturbation theory, one of the things that you have to try is simply guess and see so it's, it's not a trivial, there is no straightforward way of finding out what this S is. So usually you will make a guess and see if it satisfies, but depending on what H electron phonon is, you can make a clever guess. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to guess this S, so I know it's proportional to F, because it's equal to H electron phonon, so it should be proportional to F. So I'm going to write this as sum over KQ, F, K, Q, C, K plus Q dagger, C, K, and I'm going to assume that there are some algebraic factors or variables, x and y, and I'm going to insert them in front of these operators. So if you look at H0, H0 contains uh, number operator, C dagger C operator for electrons. So I, because S commutator of S and H naught should be equal to H electron phonon, so I keep this term as it is. But it also contains B dagger B terms, but H electron phonon does not contain B dagger B terms. That contains B dagger and B terms separately. So this would be a reasonable guess to start with because the H electron phonon does not have B dagger B terms and H naught does. So you can try to write down these commutators, also use tricks that we uh, learned in, in the first tutorial that a commutator of operators can be converted into 
either commutators or anti-commutators, and then you can use commutation and anti-commutation relations of bosonic and fermionic operators to see that this would be a reasonable guess. But this is still a guess. So let's make an answer. that s is equal to this. I still don't know what x and y are. So now I will calculate x and y by imposing the constraint that s and h naught, commutator of s h naught is equal to H electron phonon. So by imposing this constraint, I can calculate what X and Y are. And you can do this uh, calculation. You'll find that X is 1 divided by epsilon k plus q minus epsilon k minus h bar omega q and y is 1 over epsilon k plus q minus epsilon k plus h bar omega q. So in this way you can find s that does the job. Now in this particular case, finding this s is not that hard, but that does not mean, so what I should say is that this transformation may not be very helpful for some problems because it might be very hard to find what S is. In this problem is relatively easy. Sometimes you can guess a form and try to find a solution and you will find there is no solution that does it. Then you have to change your guess, try it again. Sometimes it is just not a good method to use. But in this particular problem, it's relatively easy to find what this S is. And this is our answer. In particular, when you have terms that are quadratic, or you have C dagger C or B dagger B, you have number operator type terms in one kind of operator, and you have linear terms in other kind of operators. Such kinds of problem you can do well with the schiffer wolf transformation. So now, what is left to do is to calculate this term, minus half so this term now that you know what s is calculate this commutator and you can show that this term is equal to a sum over k k prime q mod f k q square h bar omega q And the operator part is C K plus Q dagger, C dagger K prime minus Q, C K prime C K. Any questions?
So this is the contribution of phonon-mediated electron-electron interactions. What we find is that this diagram, its contribution depends on the dispersion of electrons and the dispersion of phonons. Look at this quantity. This quantity can be positive or negative. So this interaction can be attractive or repulsive, depending on the dispersion of electrons and phonons. So what does the dispersion of electrons and phonons depend on? Well, the dispersion of phonons, you know, has mass of the ions. Dispersion of electrons has all the symmetry of the electrons. Where are the ions located? It's the block wave function or the properties of the electronic state. So in general, whether this interaction is repulsive or attractive, will depend on the properties of the material. And in superconductors, we find that this interaction, there is a regime where this interaction will become attractive. So if you have epsilon k plus q minus epsilon k, is greater than h bar omega q square, then you have repulsive interactions. And we know how to treat this repulsive interactions. We've already done the Coulomb interaction. So in some sense, this is an additive term to this interaction. It will modify, it's modifying the strength of uh, Coulomb interactions. But if the opposite of this, if this electronic energy is actually smaller than the phonon energy, then you have attractive interactions. So I've already kept this minus sign, that means the final Hamiltonian is H0 plus this term. So if this term is negative, you have H0 minus the interaction term, and that is called attractive. So this is an attraction. If this is met, this is an attraction between two electrons. Any questions? Yes. How do you know the attractions between two electrons? I mean, you started with the potential between electrons. So, yes. So uh, you will see that when you do this calculation, you will have commutators of B and B daggers, and they will all become delta functions. And in the end, you will be left with only these electronic operators. So another way to see this is just this operator form. It's two incoming electrons and two outgoing electrons. So now you can say, OK, so far good, but can this condition be ever satisfied? Actually, we can easily see that it's not that hard to satisfy this condition with what we have already learned so far. So consider optical phonons. So for optical phonons, the dispersion is such that h bar omega q, this goes to a constant when q goes to 0. So if you remember the dispersion, these are the acoustic phonons, and these were the optical phonons. So when Q goes to 0, acoustic ones go to 0 linearly. And the optical ones, when Q goes to 0, it's just a constant. Now consider two electrons that are close to Fermi C. So two electrons close to 
Fermi C. In this case, if you calculate this quantity, and let's assume that close to Fermi C, close to Fermi wave vector, the dispersion is quadratic. So we have a quadratic band. In this case, you can easily calculate h bar square kf plus q. So it's close to Fermi C means the wave vector is close to Fermi wave vector. I'm considering the special case where this k is equal to Fermi wave vector and the other electron has energy slightly above it. You can show that this term goes to zero as Q goes to zero, right? So that means at least in this case, you do have attractive interactions. You don't even always need this uh, optical phonons. Even if you have acoustic phonons and the dispersion is such that it goes to zero slower than the electronic two electrons, then you can still have uh, attractive interactions. But in this case, we are sure that the interaction between the electrons is attractive. So what have we learned from this analysis? At least for two electrons that are very close to Fermi C, at least these two electrons can attract each other, mediated by phonons. Yes? But specifically when they're exchanging small amounts of momentum. Yes. In that special case, we are convinced that if Q is very, very small, they are both very close to Fermi C, both of the electrons. So in the, in other words, in long wavelength regime of phonons, when you have optical, when this is just a constant, then it should work for sure. Any other questions? Yes. Um, how do you know when this effect will dominate relative to electron-electron? It's a, a very good question. So finally, what you would do is you will write this interaction and look at the Coulomb interaction as well. So I don't have the expression here. Let me try to, so let me say it in words. So you compare this attractive interaction with screened Coulomb interactions, and then you compare the strength. If this attractive interaction is weaker than screened Coulomb interaction, then you still have net repulsion. So only when this interaction is larger than screened Coulomb interactions, you will get, uh... now in this case, if you go, this Q goes to zero, and in some cases you will find that this term is larger than screen Coulomb interactions. But you always have to compare, because as you said, this is just one term, one two electron term. There are many other interaction terms for two electrons. We have to add all of them and see whether net you have attraction or repulsion. So that's another reason why not all the materials become superconducting also, or the critical temperature for the various superconductors is very different. So it really depends on when a material can overcome the repulsion, the screen Coulomb repulsion, and when can interactions become attractive. If the electron-electron repulsion had been dominant, then would this whole transformation even still work? I think this transformation will work, but the effect of this is still a repulsion. So you, there will be no new physics uh, coming in the problem. Electrons will still repel. You can say that the strength of repulsion is a bit weaker in a sense because you have these phonons. Yeah. So, uh, uh, 
so I'm just a bit confused. Like, the Coulomb repulsion is in real space, but this attraction is in momentum space, right? So, uh, you can, uh, so, uh, we, when we, so I've written down, written it down in uh, momentum space. When we write this uh, for Coulomb interaction, will operator form will still be same. Here, you will get V tilde Q, the Fourier transform of Coulomb interaction, which we saw actually diverges as Q going to zero. So that's why I'm saying I'm comparing it with screen Coulomb interactions, where you will have one over Q square plus kappa square, where kappa is the Thomas Fermi screening wave vector. So when I say compare, let's compare in momentum space. And you can also imagine that in some materials, there might be very strong screening. And what that does is it tends to diminish the effect of Coulomb repulsion. In that case, this uh, term will dominate also. So this attraction between electrons gives rise to superconductivity, where electrons will form a bound state. Two electrons that usually repel, they will form a bound state, and that will trigger a phase transition in the material, and you, what you will have is altogether a new phase of matter that is no longer described by the description that we have done so far, like you have a Fermi C and excitations around it. We need a new description for this. This is a new phase of matter, and this is what we'll do next. So we want to understand how, or what, we want to understand what will be the effect of this interaction assuming that it is attractive. Any other questions? So, yes. How do we know that it's only two electrons that form a bound state and not more than like three electrons, four electrons? So, because, so it, again, it depends on, you can have, you can consider um, higher order interactions like you're suggesting. Typically, you will find that you will have a higher order factor here and it will be weaker. So this, or in other words, so it, it was an experimental observation that you have superconductivity. And to explain that, naturally, you start with the simplest term and this does the job. But uh, another way to address that would be the critical temperature, the temperature below which a material becomes superconducting depends on this interaction. So it depends on, say, Debye frequency. And till date, using this mechanism, this critical temperature, so this is one mechanism for superconductivity. Within this mechanism, or this, the materials to which this mechanism is applicable, the critical temperature is not that high in the sense that the critical temperature is usually below 25 Kelvin or so. There are new types of uh, superconductors called high temperature superconductors that have different, that could have different mechanism. Even they have critical temperatures around 150 Kelvin or so. The highest critical temperature, just for the records, I think is still hydrogen sulfide, which is under a lot of pressure. So you take two diamonds and you apply a lot of pressure and in a high pressure regime, you can increase the critical temperature. But at atmospheric pressures, we don't have any room temperature superconductor yet. And maybe a new mechanism could give rise to... So we have seen one mechanism that provides attractive interactions. There could be others as well. We are not saying that there are no other mechanisms. Okay, so let me start with the introduction to any other questions. So next, we are going to uh, tackle the problem of superconductivity. And uh, the way we'll do this is the following. We'll first note down, so the way superconductivity evolved is first it was discovered experimentally. What uh, was observed is the resistivity of a material it just drops to zero at, when you cool it down. So as if the material has no resistance and current flows without any uh, 
resistance. So conductivity is infinite. And this was observed in 1911 or long before we understood why it's happening. In 30s, 1930s and 1940s, a lot of very serious attempts were made by uh, some very famous people to explain this uh, phenomena. But the microscopic theory, which includes this interaction, was not known till uh, the BCS paper, the Bardeen Cooper Schiffer paper in, uh, I think, 67 or so. So till late 60s. So it was a difficult problem. And uh, what you can say is because there was such so many decades of experimental data, it made, you can say either it made their job easy or difficult. Easy in the sense that they had some experimental facts to motivate their uh, guesswork or motivate their solution. And also, they had these data, so their theory must already be strong enough to explain all of these uh, observed facts. So first, I'm just going to state what experimental observations BCS had to explain. And then we'll go through the theory and explain all of these experimental observations. So the first one is what I just mentioned. If you plot the resistivity rho of the material as a function of temperature, they found that resistivity, it usually decreases when you cool the system down. But at some temperature, let's call it Tc, that is the critical temperature below which the material becomes superconductor, this resistivity just drops to zero. <coughs> the second is called Meissner effect. What this says is what, what was observed is if you have a superconductor, and you put the superconductor in external magnetic field, all the field lines are repelled. So superconductor is a perfect diamagnet. So the magnetic field lines, so these are external magnetic field lines. Inside the superconductor, the field is zero. So this is called Meissner effect. Superconductor is a perfect uh, diamagnet. Now, later on, there was, so now we know, this is what they had to explain. Now we know that there are many types of superconductors. So this happens, it's a perfect diamagnet, till a critical field. If you go on increasing the external field, there will come a point when the superconductor will no longer be superconducting, it will become normal. So superconductor, it expels magnetic field till a critical magnetic field BC. So you can put a superconductor in magnetic field. If its strength is below some critical strength, superconductor will expel all the magnetic field. It won't let any of the flux through it. There is a new, there is another class of superconductors. So these are called type one superconductors. There is a type, there is another class of superconductors called type two superconductors, which do the same thing till a critical field. But now, so this is type one that has one critical field. You can also have type two superconductors, which have two critical fields. So for B, magnetic field less than critical field, you have Meissner effect. For type two, for magnetic field less than first critical field, you have Meissner effect. But there is a new phase where magnetic field is greater than the first critical field, less than the second critical field, where the superconductor does not become normal, but it allows 
some magnetic flux to go through it in the form of vortices. And then above this critical field, the second critical field, it becomes normal. So this was again known experimentally, so they had to explain. Their theory must explain Meissner effect. So the next piece of data that was available to them was measurement of specific heat as a function of temperature. So experimentally measured specific heat at constant volume. So this is also the uh, electronic specific heat, different from specific heat contribution of ions to the specific heat, something that we discussed yesterday that goes as T cube. So we'll just discuss this in a minute. What was seen experimentally was this. So for for normal state or for normal metals which have a Fermi surface and electrons are filled up till this Fermi surface and then you can excite the electrons for something that we discussed earlier and instead of parabola you can think of bands but still the picture holds that you have a Fermi surface. For normal materials you expect electronic contribution to the specific heat to be linear with temperature. So I can quickly explain you why you should expect this. So this is contribution of electrons to specific heat. Now what is contribution of phonons? How does that go? You saw that goes as T cube. And I think in the tutorial today you will do problem where you actually calculate the integral and show that this is indeed the case. So the divide temperature for let's take an example, aluminium is around 400 Kelvin. So if you do this calculation at 4 Kelvin, if you try to figure out what this factor T over TD is, T over TD cube, you'll find that this is already negligible, 10 to the power minus 6. So when you are very low temperatures around 4 Kelvin, the ionic contribution to specific heat is negligible and the contribution to specific heat comes from electronic degrees of freedom. So we'll next calculate, so we know that the ionic contribution goes as T cube, we discussed yesterday. Here I'm saying that the electronic contribution should go linearly for metals. So let me try to explain why. We can understand this by just looking at the Fermi function. So this is the Fermi function plotted as a function of energy. This is at t equal to 0. At 0 temperature, this Fermi function is 1 for all energy values below EF and it is 0 above EF. At finite temperature, you know from thermodynamics, if you try to plot 1 over e to the power beta e minus 1, what you see is the following. At finite, this is t equal to 0. At finite temperatures, you see something like this. Looks the same. So this is the finite temperature Fermi function. This width is of the order of KBT. So my goal is now to calculate the electronic contribution to specific heat. So first I will find out what is the electronic energy, how does electronic energy goes as a function of temperature and then I will take its derivative to find the specific heat. So uh, my goal is to find out what is 
electronic energy. as a function of temperature. So let me first calculate number of electrons per unit volume in the interval number of electrons that are excited. Excited above EF. What I mean by that is I want to calculate the electron, number of electrons that get excited below the Fermi C to above the Fermi C because of finite temperature. Now I'm going to assume that the density of state is constant over this interval. What is density of state? It's the number of states available for occupation at a given energy. I'm going to assume that this density of state is constant over the length, over the scale, energy scale of KBT. So the total number of electrons per unit volume is simply the density of state, which is constant, times this energy interval. So it's this multiplied by KBT. And the excitation energy by how much energy you're exciting these electrons is also given by KBT. So this means that the total electronic energy, let's call it U electronic, is some zero temperature version, U electronic at T equal to zero, plus let's, this calculation is not very precise. So I'm just going to put some, some factor N, G, E, F, K, B, T, square. This means the specific heat as function of temperature goes linearly with temperature. So what I've shown you here is that the contribution, electronic contribution to the specific heat of a material, of a metal, of a solid crystal with ions and electrons moving all around it, a sea of electrons, goes linearly, is linear with temperature. And this is what we would have expected, this linear behavior. So by the way, this calculation, this ad hoc way of all we have done is look at Fermi function and calculated uh, this specific heat. If you do a more uh, sophisticated calculation by including the dispersion relation, density of state, and basically calculating the expectation value of C dagger C and then taking derivative, you, this is not very far off. You will find that this N is pi square over 6. So what we should expect for a material is this linear behavior. Instead, what experiments found is that at TC, there is a discontinuity in specific heat. And there is a jump. And below TC, the specific heat is exponentially suppressed. Now, this provides a lot of hint to the problem of superconductivity. If you have an experimental result like this, you can infer a lot of things. First, there is a discontinuity in a thermodynamic function. This usually suggests that there is a phase transition. So at TC, something drastic is happening in our system. So there might be a phase transition that is happening. So from this measurement, BCS knew that the superconducting state is where you do have 
zero resistivity and Meissner effect. This state is might be something fundamentally new. It might be a new phase, altogether different from the metallic phase of crystals. Now also, so from the same plot, you can, so if you try to fit, try to uh, fit this with the function, you find that this is, so let's bury all of this in terms of gamma. So let's say this line is gamma times t, the straight line. So what you find is below, for the superconductor, you find the specific heat goes as gamma Tc <coughs> exponential minus B Tc over T. So this is in the superconducting phase. Below Tc. And they found that this B is 1.5. So it's typically around 1.5 for a variety of materials. Now what, do, what can we say from this? So the specific heat, the electronic specific heat is exponentially suppressed. What does that mean? That means that it is very difficult to excite electrons thermally. So specific heat is a measure of uh, how you can increase the temperature of an object, so how you can add energy to the system. Because it's exponentially suppressed, that means it is very hard to add energy to the electrons. What does this mean? This means that there might be a gap in the electronic dispersion. So this suggests exponentially suppressed specific heat suggests that there might be a gap in the electronic dispersion. What does I mean? What does it mean to have a gap in the electronic dispersion? What that simply means is that the density of states is zero. You have no states available for occupation when the system has a gap. So this exponential suppression suggests that the electronic, so we assume parabolic dispersion, density of state as a function of energy, it was a smooth function. But now this suggests that it's not a smooth function. There might be a gap, there might be a region around uh, which there are no density of state, so there, it might go to zero in some finite energy interval. Any questions so far? Yes. So how is this different from an insulator where we also have a gap? So uh, because it is exponentially suppressed, and so the behavior is different. For example, if it is exponentially suppressed here, but you also see that there is a jump in the sense that it is enhanced in some region also. So what is, I mean, it's a, it's a good question and I can answer physically. It's easier for me to answer because we know BCS theory for six decades, but this was probably not as easy at that time. So if you look here, the, it's exponentially suppressed close to zero. So here we expect density of state to be very small. But here it is enhanced also. So there is some rearrangement of electronic density of state that was in the normal material from zero to Tc. So what does imply is that when this phase transition happens, the electronic density of states rearrange themselves and they put all of their weight at some at close to Tc or at some energy scale and a gap opens up below that. So in some sense, you can say that for an insulator, it will be a more hard suppression. 
So it will just be zero. It is not a rearrangement of uh, normal density states. Any other questions? Next, what they knew is isotope effect, which is that the critical temperature goes as m to the power minus alpha, where m is mass of the isotope or the isotopic mass. So for example, you take the material, you calculate its TC by cooling it down and either measuring resistivity and see where it goes to zero. Then you change the isotope. So if you have aluminum, you change its isotope, you add some neutral or take a material where all the ions are replaced by a different isotope. And then you do the same experiment again and you find the critical temperature. And when you do this kind of experiment, you find that the critical temperature goes as m to the power minus alpha, where alpha is approximately half. So from this observation, they knew that ions are very important, mass of the ions. So phonons might be crucial in this problem. So this suggests that phonons might play an important role in superconductivity. So next, we already discussed, they knew that in some limit, especially for two electrons, close to Fermi C, you can get attractive interaction. So this is what our task is. We want to develop a theory that explains now a new phase of matter, which is called, which are, we'll call, we're going to call superconductors. And that should explain all these features. Yes. So is that an experimental observation? Or which one? The two electrons close to Fermi C. No, so that is what we just did. This was known theoretically. This expression, it was known, I think, late 40s or something. I think experimentally, it is still very hard to measure whether interact because you because of the Coulomb interactions. Uh. Yes. So uh, we're assuming that the, well, we saw that phonons behave as bosons, right? Yeah. But I was checking on my notes, and I think that came from uh, the fact that we are assuming that ions are also bosons. No, no, not at all. So how, yeah. So ions can be fermions. So the reason we assume that they are bosons, we don't assume, we show, the way we showed that they are bosons is these uh, commutation relations. So think of these phonons, they are quasi-particles. So they are not any fundamental particles, like these gauge bosons in the standard model. They're not fundamental particles. These are really quasi-particles that are made up of excitations that involve 10 to the power 23 ions. So these are effective particles that correspond to sound waves. So we quantized 
the spring and mass, assuming that ions are just point mass, nothing to do with bosons or fermions, forget its spin altogether, assume that it's a mass that is attached to another, another mass by springs. So when we quantize this theory, we got phonons and they obey commutation relations. So everything is, would be the same if we consider that ions, well, we just forget about what ions are. Ions can be fermionic or bosonic, it would not matter, as long as they obey the harmonic uh, approximation, as long as we keep the displacement small and mm -hmm. everything else here. Any other questions? Okay, so next, what we are going to do is called the Cooper problem. And we are going to do a very simple problem, which is we know that two electrons close to Fermi C can be attracted to each other. So the goal of this problem is to look at these two electrons, but in the presence of non-interacting Fermi C. What do I mean by that is, so consider that you have Fermi C. And this Fermi C is filled. Well, that's the definition of Fermi C, right? It's non and on top of this, I have two electrons, two additional electrons. Now, two additional electrons, all the states below Fermi C are occupied. They must have momentum larger than Kf. So these two electrons, say, are somewhere here. The other electron is here. And we are going to assume that these two electrons have attractive interactions between them. So we are going to assume that the Coulomb repulsion and all other things are smaller and the net interaction between these two electrons is attractive. We are going to ignore all other details of this interaction. We are just going to assume that this interaction is attractive. We are going to ignore its momentum dependence or any other dependence on what kind of phononic branch or where it is coming from. Ignore everything, just assume it's attractive. And the goal is to see whether there can be a bound state in this problem. Now, an important thing to remember is the presence of this Fermi C. So these two electrons are interacting among each other, but the Fermi C is non-interacting. That means these electrons are not interacting with any of these electrons inside the Fermi C. So the role of Fermi C is in a sense to block all the states below Kf. Any questions? So in our first lecture when we talked about the wave function for so now we have a two body problem. Let's try, it. let's talk about the wave function of this, these two particles, psi r1 minus r2. We will denote r1. So, okay, now let's do this analysis. If we expect that there is a bound state, what would, what would we expect? We would expect these two electrons to be close to each other in real space. So we would expect that this R1 minus R2 is very small. For a bound state, so if a bound state exists, we would expect R is relative coordinate, we would expect R to
to be very small. Now, in the limit r going to 0, so if I exchange two particles, then I know that the fermion, fermionic wave function should get a minus sign. It's anti-symmetric under exchange. Now, if I expect a bound state, that means r should be 0. Now, this equation implies that psi of r should be 0. In fact, we use this to derive, in a sense, the Pauli's exclusion principle, right? So this analysis suggests that there cannot be a bound state. If there is a bound state, we expect the two positions to be same, to be very close to each other, and the wave function when the relative coordinate is very small, we expect it to be finite. This analysis tells us that this wave function must be zero. That would mean that bound state should not exist. Now, what we are going to discuss next is there is another way of picking a minus sign when you exchange two fermions. In this analysis, we've assumed that this is our total wave function. This assumed that nothing, the wave function does not depend on spin of the electrons or spin of the fermions. So whatever is the spin here is the same spin here. So in the spin space, this analysis assumes that in spin space, you have symmetric wave function. Yes? Um, like when we derive the, um, hydrogen atom orbitals, we get solutions that are zero at the origin, but they're still bound states, and that's ignoring spin. So why couldn't we have a bound state that goes to zero at zero separation? So it's not uh, zero in the sense that it is bound to a positive charge or like in the hydrogen atom case. This is zero in the sense that we expect the electrons to be close to each other. So it's the it's a relative coordinate between two electrons, and also this is not uh, not a very. Uh, I mean, it, it is true that it is say it is zero here, but you're saying it is zero here, but can be finite somewhere else. So in fact, we do know that if the spin part is symmetric, the wave function will be like what you said. It is. Now, the question becomes whether you call this a bound state or not. So if there is no other charge, this would be a scattering state. This would not be a bound state. In hydrogen atom case, you have zero, but then you have a peak, but you again have zero, exponentially even. That is, if that happens, then you can still call, uh, say that this is a bound state, but that is not going to happen here. So in that sense, it is different from what you're asking. Any other questions? OK. So in this analysis, the spin, the wave function is independent spin. We expect spin part to be same on left hand side and right hand side. Now, what we can do is we can choose the spin part to be different in the sense that we can choose the spin part to be anti-symmetric. What that would mean is if you exchange two particles, the spin part of the wave function gives you a minus sign. In that case, in the real space, the wave function could be symmetric. And in that case, this analysis would not apply, and therefore, you would not conclude that the bound state cannot exist. In fact, this analysis will tell you that if bound state exists, the wave function must be anti-symmetric in spin space. So what that means is I can write down, so this wave function must be, this is the spatial part, and this is tensor product with the spin part, which I am writing as up, down, minus, down, up, uh, 
So in this notation, this is also called spin singlet state. In this notation, this is particle 1, this is particle 2, particle 1, particle 2. So if you exchange these two particles, you would see you will get a negative sign from this part. So that will take care of the statistics. That will take care of the fact that the total wave function is anti-symmetric. Now if you do this analysis, you would not conclude that this term should be zero when the relative coordinate is very small. That means this kind of wave function with this particular property in this particular part for the spin could represent a bound state of two electrons. Any questions? So next, I'm going to write down the Hamiltonian for these two electrons, and then we are going to look at the solution for this wave function. Now, let's look at the Hamiltonian in the first quantized form. So we can write this Hamiltonian in terms of center of mass and relative coordinate. Now, the center of mass Hamiltonian, you can write it as the center of mass. So these are all, uh, these, are, these are momentum operators. The center of mass momentum square and the relative, similarly, the relative Hamiltonian in the relative coordinate is the relative momentum square divided by m. So this is general uh, two-body Hamiltonian. You go through deriving this, do all the steps. I think you all also did this in the first tutorial when you had two particles and go to center of mass and relative coordinates. You would see that the, uh, this here you will get m and not 2m. Now, we will minimize the energy of this particular object. We'll choose such that the center of mass momentum is zero. So we are going to minimize the energy of in the center of mass coordinate. Because center of mass coordinate is actually not, we are not interested in center of mass coordinate, but we are interested in the relative coordinate here. So we want to ignore any dynamics in the center of mass coordinate. So let's forget this to be zero. So we are choosing the center of mass to be zero, center of mass momentum to be zero. What that means is the momentum of two electrons is equal and opposite. So what that means for us is, so this is Fermi C, all states below are occupied. So if one electron has momentum K, this K has to be greater than KF. The other electron, it should actually be at minus K. So in this situation, you have zero center of mass uh, and you will have some relative motion. Yes? How is it possible that there is a current if we have electrons having opposite momentum? So there is nothing in the center of mass coordinate. Center of mass momentum is zero. So there is no, uh, so in that, you can think of the wave function in this center of mass coordinate, the real space, is just going to be a plane wave. Like we said. It's not a bound, yeah. yeah we said for superconductors, the resistance, like, the conductance is infinite, so we should have a current if we... Uh, so we are not there yet. We'll see that uh, uh, that is altogether a different phase. So that's a good question. How uh, is this related to the current of the system? So we'll do that calculation later, and we'll see that uh, we'll have. So later on, we will find that there are uh, quasi particles that behave, that effectively carry the current. These are going to be different from uh, these uh, uh, element, let's say, 
these electrons in the normal state. So this, this Hamiltonian, this, so we can, I'm just going to now write down the Schrodinger equation that we want to solve. So the two particle Schrodinger equation is minus h bar square over 2 over m, sorry, m, the gradient in r square psi of r. So this is a two body wave function. This r is the relative coordinate, r1 minus r2. So this is equation for only relative coordinate. r is the separation between the two coordinates. And I'm going to write the energy eigenvalue corresponding to this state psi of r in a special way. So I'm going to write the energy as 2 EF plus E. The reason is these two electrons, they must be outside the Fermi surface, so they must be the total energy we expect it to be above, to be more than two times the Fermi energy. Now the goal is to find and to see if this equation admits a solution with negative E. That will correspond to a bound state. So a bound state would actually lower its energy. So same as what you do in scattering problems for the bound state. If you have attractive potential, a particle can get bound inside the potential and lower its energy. So this is the same idea. Any questions so far? So next, I'm going to Fourier transform this equation. And in, so let's go to Fourier space. What we will find is h bar square k square over 2m psi k <coughs> plus sum over k k prime v k k prime psi k prime is equal to 2 epsilon EF plus E <coughs> psi k, where V k k prime is this Fourier transform. If I substitute e to the power i k, I get this. It's just the two. Ah, this two. So, yeah, it might be. So, let's see. So, there is this psi. You can define the Fourier transform as so psi of r. This is, let's say, T cube K over 2 pi cube, psi K 
e to the power i k dot r. Yeah, so I think this might be just one. Yeah. Thanks, actually, this is crucial. So next, I can write this equation as E minus 2 times psi k. psi k sum over k prime v k k prime psi k prime where psi k is epsilon k minus e f where epsilon k now is with 2. So this epsilon k has is h bar square k square over 2m and here we have 2 times this so we actually should have only m there. Any questions? So I'm going to start from this equation tomorrow and just sketch what we are going to do next. This is still a very complicated equation. We don't know what this VKK prime is. What we are going to do is make an approximation, what is called on-shell approximation. What that means is, I will assume that this is my Fermi surface. I will assume that the interactions in a small window of energy around the Fermi energy I will assume that V k k prime is minus v for epsilon k minus epsilon f less than equal to some cutoff h bar omega c and epsilon k prime also and is zero otherwise. So what this approximation means, it's an oversimplification. We have a complicated in two-body interaction potential. Now we are saying is for a small energy window <coughs> around Fermi energy, if the two electrons happen to be within this energy window, they attract <coughs> and the interaction is just a constant, it's attractive and it's zero otherwise. Yes. How can we estimate the cutoff omega c? Is it something we can choose? So for the moment, this is just uh, put in by hand. This cutoff, we don't have any uh, any uh, expression for it. We don't know what it is. We will find that a good uh, frequency here will be, for example, Debye frequency. But if you want to really think think about this, what is the cutoff? If this interaction is really coming from phonons, then the length scale, the phonon energy scale would be a good cutoff. But for the moment, it's just a new variable. We don't know where it is coming from. The, uh, the point is just to simplify the, this equation. Any other questions? Thank you.